Hi, Jadeep. Uh, if I is not showing live here. Yeah. So it's a pleasure to invite you in Thought Leadership webcast. We are now live. And I'm, it's a great pleasure to invite you. And I, first of all, want to introduce you to the audience. Uh, so why we chose you? Because you have come from a very niche background and having a quite a lot of industry experience. to the audience. Uh, you have an so industry why experience. we chose you? Because you have come from a very niche. And uh, you are coming from a very niche background, having a professional experience as well as academic research experience. And let me tell you a few words about you first. So Joydeep Ghosh received a B.Tech in Electrical Engineering from Jadavpur University, India in 2005, and M.Tech in Micro and Nano Systems from the Technical University of Chemnitz in, in 2011 from Germany, and a Ph.D. degree from the Technical University of Vienna, Austria in 2016. He has worked as a software developer in IBM India Private Limited for three years. He was a postdoctoral fellow. He was a postdoctoral fellow, uh, and uh, in uh, in IIT Bombay. And now uh, he is currently working as a research fellow in NUS EC Department, Singapore. His research interests include semiconductor devices, circuits, applying ML algorithms to perform their failure analysis. In his career. He has published several research papers, journals, and talked in conferences. And he has also received awards for his presentation from international conferences. So as I said, it's a great pleasure to have you here. And we try to know some of your experiences in semiconductor industry, electronic industry, as well as what you see in the, in the near future. Where is data science heading? And what are the capabilities that we should try to utilize uh, to have uh, the maximum out of this field. So, Jaydeep, it's now up to you. Now, let me ask, uh, start uh, asking you one question. Can you please share one of the most uh, important or one of the most uh, exciting projects that you have done related to data science in your domain? OK, so hello to everyone. Hello and namaste to everyone. I hope everything is doing good amid this uh, pandemic and all those things. It's a very tough time that we are going through. But anyway, so we'll. Hopefully, we'll recover. So, to answer this question, yeah, okay. So, uh, thanks for your nice introduction. Obviously, you told a lot of things. So, basically, my background is, yeah, mainly on semiconductor stuffs and then a device point of view or circuit point of view. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I have also software de software development background. So, I was in IT company. Uh, I worked for more than two and a half years and you know this. And in my PhD work, actually PhD was not on AI, honestly. So it was my different domain, although I had to do a lot of coding during my PhD. So it was mainly C++, MATLAB using all those things. Yeah. And it's a basically tool development uh, kind of thing. So there'll be software development to uh, uh, do some uh, physics purpose, whatever. So yeah, okay. So yeah, so I've been uh, working for with Mamel since last one and a half years now. Yeah, ML has been uh, very, very popular, as in, as you all know. So ML is a very significant, it's playing a very significant role, AI and all. AI is a big umbrella, then ML, and then going for neural networks and all those things to understand the patterns, more mathematical approach or statistical approach that people are doing. Yeah, we also need that. I'll come to the, all those things. Why do we need that? Obviously, we have our tools as well. We have, so electronics industry or semiconductor industry, basically, they are fab guys. So they're experimental, hardcore experimental guys, so manufacturing. Real manufacturing means a lot of, you know, dealing with a lot of instruments, just like, you know, any other industry, like automobile, you know. And then, uh, so, so just like in automotive, automotive industry, people use, for manufacturing purpose, people use now robotic arms, robots, you know. So they are reducing manpower now. So they're going for towards this more training or this robot so that those things can do perform these uh, difficult tasks. The same thing is happening also in semiconductor. So for, for manufacturing, uh, we have, when I was in uh, Germany, I have seen uh, in, in the university level, I have seen, you know, robotic arms, which do robotic arms, so which do wafer, wafer transfer from one place to another place there. So think about industry and that, that, that was in 2010. So right now industries are using like extensively, obviously, and humans are operating those robots, obviously human, Obviously, humans are obviously required. It's not like that. It's completely 
got rid of human interaction, but yeah, robots, uh, robotic stuff is. So uh, the programming training the robots is important or training the robotic arms is an important task. Now, so this is the more towards, you know, fabrication stuff, the main processing, you know, fab, uh, what do they process? So we have our chips, microchips, right? It's getting reduced every day. I mean, over the last 20 years, you know, from 130 nanometer node to towards now we have three nanometer nodes. So even one to two, two and a half nanometer node, two nanometer, there are a lot of terms actually. And different companies like Intel, TSMC, these are big giants, right? They, uh, from fabrication point of view, IBM, they use these uh, miniature chips. Uh, so that's why our mobile phone has got, you know, so smartphones and we have uh, billions of transistors implanted there in a, in a motherboard. So it's a very complicated stuff. So in complicated stuff, you know, things are getting complicated, first of all. And second important thing is that, uh, okay, before 10 years back, okay, there was a major, major change in semiconductor industry. When people introduced MinFET, if you know uh, device physics, devices, then you must be knowing MOSFET. MOSFET is something you already know, guys. So MOSFET, diodes, these things we, we were taught in our BTEX times. Uh, mainly BJTs, BJTs was there. But BJT is not that popular these days. MOSFET people, obviously, MOSFET took it over and so on. So these days, MOSFET are not that much used. Uh, since 2012, IBM had introduced FinFET, and a 22 nanometer technology node. FinFET is a very complicated device. It's an architecture, so three-dimensional architecture that uh, planar devices were generally on two-dimensional. We used to plot two-dimensional just to source, source train and gate and in between. So FinFET is a three-dimensional thing. And actually, FinFET has a lot of advantages over, over the MOSFETs, over the conventional CMOS technology. Because FinFET has short-channel effects, uh, lower short-channel effects, and FinFET, a lot of things. If you want to really discuss, and I can also tell about that. So when you introduce this FinFET 3D structure, so now we are, so electronics is going towards a, a lot of things, a lot of change. So, I mean, I don't know which, in which industry we see this many, this much of miniaturization kind of thing. It never happens. In the electronics industry, it's really happening. Now, as software, as softwares have been developed as well, accordingly, in parallel to support, hardware are supporting the software. So double hardware development is also going, you know, improving to support the software. as well. these things, all things are going on over the years. Now, uh, okay, so why do we need machine learning? That's the question, right? Yeah, and a one use case, if you can cite that where oh, you yes, have yeah, to I'll tell. Like, sure. yeah, I have and, to make some yeah. nice, uh, nice story here. So why do we need machine learning is one question. So, okay. So, uh, okay, let's see. Uh, failure analysis is one of the things, one of the things that uh, where this machine learning is used here. There are other things as well, but I'll, I'll talk about more on this failure stuff. And, Failure analysis is basically, you know, you have to find a defect. So whenever you are fabricating a chip, there is a there is a probability of maybe one person less, even less than one person, my point one person of some. There's a probability of a defect. Defect means a failure. Failure. The chip doesn't work at all. There's a probability, right? From probability point of view, statistics point of view, you always say a 10 to minus one or 10 to minus two is a probability. So but but when you do a lot of experiments, so you have, for example, industry industry give you 100 chips, or they make 500 chips. Out of the one will be defective. It's very hard to find, right? Mm -hmm. How do you find? So you have to do a lot of experiments. So yeah, those things, and you have to do, go through a lot of things. Experiment is not easy because experiments are very expensive. So when you do a failure analysis in industry, uh, TM transmission electron microscopy is used for this uh, failure uh, identification. Uh, nanoprobing with SEM scanning electron microscope is also used for failure analysis. These two are very popular. And CAFM, this AFM, they also use AFM. So AFM is atomic force microscopy. So AFM basically surface type, surface type information you will get. From SEM, you will have a morphological, not more for outs, outside surface in, uh, information, but transmission electron means it really electrons penetrate the sample. So in such a case, you'll have a more internal uh, way of internal stuffs, internal uh, information of the of the if a microchip when you have we are given with the microchip, right? So uh, yeah. So what yeah, was so saying? So. Yeah, the machine learning technique. Yeah, the machine learning. Yeah, I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming. Gradually, so analysis. yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's a basic, basically, yeah. So up to now, what you what you under, people understand, this is the more experimental stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there is experimental stuff, but if, to support the experiment, obviously we need a layer of machines and a lot of patience to generate IV curves. You know, one of the IV, IV curves, as you know, right? Current versus voltage. It's a very popular curve that we used to plot when we were BTEC. 
So if you guys really, you know, even if you have machine, uh, computer science background, if you can remember that, we used to plot IV carb of a diode and more uh, PJTs and so on. So that's an input that we have. And uh, so experimentally, it's very difficult uh, to identify a chip which is defective. So let's do, so people generally do go for a simulation stuff, which is a computer-based thing. So semiconductor industry or IC, we have a simulation part as well. So there are some simulation engineers. So apart from this process technology, we have simulation guys who are doing a technology CAD, so CAD. So CAD is very general term. So in semiconductor industry, people call this TCAD, technology computer-aided design, to uh, maybe design the microchip. You know, uh, For example, you can design a MOSFET as well. You can define a design mm -hmm. a three-dimensional structure. A lot of things you can do geometrically, you can do. I mean, just to realize that just, just the device you can realize. You can also do circuit, but circuit generally for circuit simulation, people do spice. Might have heard about this PS spice we used to do in our VTEC. So we have obviously has, it has evolved these things. Now people have a lot of spice, spice uh, capability and uh, spice simulation tools as well. Cadence is very popular, by uh, simulation tool, uh, EDA tools, and a lot of things. Anyway, so software, soft, this is obviously software industry are developing those tools, obviously, to support. For example, TCAT has been supported by Synopsys and Silvaco. Spice simulation tools also supported by Synopsys, Silvaco, and other, other software guys. So, the simulation tools, yeah. Yeah, so the simulations, coming, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so the simulation simulation is, no, uh, still, still no machine learning. learning. No, 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 still no machine learning. Machine learning are, are, are coming gradually. So, uh, so uh, okay. So, in order to replicate the ex a real experimental thing, you can do simulations, uh, computer simulations too. And now the thing is, <coughs> okay. So, imagine a case when you are given with a chip, uh, you don't know where the defect is, uh, whatever. So, how do you do that? Then you have to design that chip in the simulator. In the TCAT, uh, then you have to run a lot of simulations to replicate that's the uh, characteristics of the chip, right? So, and you are given with another chip again, you have to do again a lot of simulations. So, it's a kind of loop, you have to do similar loop again and again. So, apart from doing that, what can be a good option? Good option is to train a machine which can defect, which can determine, right? If you train yeah. a machine or train an algorithm which can you know, if the algorithm is trained trained with this information of the defects in different ways, the training obviously needs a domain knowledge. It's not only about machine learning, it obviously depends, <coughs> demands the domain knowledge of electronics, uh, electrical, whatever. So if you can train a model which can <coughs> determine defects, okay, I'm talking about, I'll come about the defect later on because defect is a big term actually, it's a big umbrella. Defect mean, can mean a lot of things. So. So let's. So we are planning to uh, uh, train the machine, machine learning algorithm, so that it can defer, determine the defect. How to do that? So, okay. So let's talk about the defect. Defect can be various types, right? So if you have a geometry of 3D geometry, the geometric variation will be there. So if you go for microprocessing, you know, in a very <coughs> 22 nanometer node or 14 nanometer node. It's so a very nanometer node. If you guys do, un do understand or not, I don't know. But nanometer node is basically reducing the gate length, basically, mm -hmm. or reducing the gate length or dimension of the overall dimension of the microchip, overall dimension of the fin fate, or even later on GA fate, gate all around structures. There are a lot of structures actually. There are a lot of architecture. So uh, if you go for uh, yeah this miniaturization thing, then yeah. Uh, defect can be uh, so there's a metallization stage, right? Metallization is to make contacts like copper contact or aluminum contact in fabrication. Obviously, you have to make some metal contact so that you know chips can be accessed from the outside world. Then you make some, <coughs> you put some voltmeter, ammeter kind of thing, and then you measure the IV characteristics and so on. So metallization is important. So during metallization stage, it might be raised and short. So there might be deposition of metals or deposition of other materials, which will cause some resistive shorts in the in the in the in the, in the device. So in a simpler manner, you can model that very easily. Actually, obviously, it's a complicated thing. It's not very easy, but from modeling point of view, modeling guys generally they sim try to make it simplified so that they can make a, a computer stuff. Otherwise, you cannot really go for a computer simulation a later on machine learning. In order to go to a computer simulation, you have uh, machine learning, you have to go via computer system, right? So this is a, actually, we call it digital twin. Digital twin basically are making a digital copy of the hardware thing, okay? Mm -hmm. So if you have a hardware thing like FinFit, 
then obviously if you compare with this uh, automobile industry you think about their car car has different parts right but people also sim computer simulation of, of different parts they have it right so it's like that so that's so are you modeling the individual yeah. are you modeling the individual parts or the whole uh, the, you can do it yeah it's a big question actually so for for the time being i have started with the one device let's say it's mm -hmm. a finfet finfet device okay but uh, mm -hmm. later on you have to move for a circuit whole circuit so finfet device if you guys know cmos inverter all any kind of dlat circuit you know a lot of circuits you can imagine of <coughs> random access memory you can think about or uh, you can think about a lot of things uh, start, so in such a case we will need a lot of transistors so it's a one step further so if you have if we can figure out defect in a semiconductor the next question would be or just a device device next question would be can you really find the same follow the same procedure to find it for a big circuit as well next question would be had array of circuits you know it's so we have a hardware system so we have an array of things so array of circuits and it's a very complicated thing we have a lot of transistors can you really find out the defective transistor or defective transistor out of that for in order to do that we have to do this sub simulation thing and then we have to train the machine with perfect features mm -hmm. once we can do that then if you give it, give the machine uh, uh, this algorithm, the new data of new experimental data, it can re readily tell you what is the defect. And if you give the another sample, uh, another defective uh, sample, it can also readily tell you what is the defect. It's very simple. Once the machine is trained, it's a very simple step. But if so without you... machine learning, we have to do simulations yeah. every time. So that's the benefit we'll have. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, when you are training those machines, are you use any uh, any particular feature selection, or you yeah, have uh, exactly. yeah, the algorithm is only doing the feature selection? Oh, how, for the how time you... yeah, exactly, exactly. If you have big data, so if you have, oh, I now I haven't got the big data, but if you think about big data, so as I told you about this electronic stuff, if you have huge circuits, <coughs> array of memory devices, or whatever, then it's a really big data. In such a case, up to now, whatever I've done is machine learning basic algorithms like random for i mean supervised learning unsupervised also we have tried <coughs> but yeah supervised learning we have checked uh random forest kind of approach or xg boost they are giving us good results actually so no okay. up more and uh, more than 90 percent accuracy can be achieved but in near future you never know so we haven't done real big problems so we'll do that uh, we have to think uh how to do that but feature selection i even i don't know i cannot tell right now we are doing that but for device point of view, you can I can say the feature may be a on-off current, uh, threshold voltage, sub-threshold swing. From the, if the guys who have domain knowledge, they can understand. So these things are domain knowledge. Uh, sorry, uh, obviously it's coming from domain knowledge is feature selection. So these are very important features of a device. And uh, for fun, circuit of point of view, there are these features of, uh, as well. Uh, it's very simple actually. If you think about DC analysis of the circuit and transient analysis of the circuit, you can come out with a lot of features. You know, then you have to make you can make a, a big database uh, to train the model and uh, you know to, for prediction purpose. It's possible. So up to now, we in device, yeah, we always one of our uh, published results. We we show, show that. Yeah. So how is the how large is the data set? Means how large yeah. will you get? You want this is a good question device? actually. Data set, you know, data sets up to now. Okay, let's say it's uh, one thousand data. It's not much. So with uh, maybe thirty features on average, thirty features on average, uh, one thousand data. Mm -hmm. So it's not a really large. It's not big, large, big, uh, big data, data, um, big data stuff. People say, but uh, up to now it's like that. But uh, later on, obviously, it will be very high. And if you say, as I said, so defect. If you have multiple defects, right? So defect can be, as I said, so a short raised short can be defect. But another defect may be geometry. Let's say it's a varying mm -hmm. geometry. So okay, it should be ten nanometer, but it's, it's varying Gaussian distribution from seven to thirteen nanometer. You understand, right? That's also another kind of defect. If you really incorporate all those things as a huge analysis, then this GitHub is gonna be, you know, even one billion if, if you really incorporate all the effects. But obviously, from physics point of view, uh, this, as we know, uh, from modeling point of view, what we do is start from the beginning and you go and uh, to incorporate more codes and to improve it, you know, to understand even bigger stuff. So for the time being, one should start from the device point of view. And uh, there's another thing I didn't tell. So material also, you can also, one can check some material point of view defects. It's, it's very tough. It's not very easy. So we have to use some more tools 
So and uh, one has to have a physics background. Otherwise, he cannot understand how to uh, operate those tools and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how it is. So yeah, it's a big data. One day we'll see a big data, and then we have to do a neural network thing, and you know a lot of other things. Which up to now, machine learning, simple machine learning is giving us good result. Uh, it's okay. I mean, for the time being, but later on, and there are a lot of things can be done. I cannot reveal everything, but yeah, a lot of things can be done. Yeah. So yeah. so the machine learning part is out of simulation, if I understand it correctly, right? No, simulation. Next stage of the simulation. So simulation. Okay. Is Inside the simulation, yeah. we can do uh, the machine learning also. Yeah. Inside the simulation, okay. So if you use TCAT simulator, so it's really basically TCAT or spy simulation. Mm -hmm. Machine learning will come later, actually. For, by simulations, you have to generate a lot of data mm -hmm. so that a machine can be trained in a better way with good features so that machine can do prediction when real experimental data comes of a defective device. So if real experimental data, and sometimes it's difficult to find real experimental data as well. So if you talk about seven nanometer node or five nanometer node, you know, industries who are walking in this direction, they will not reveal all the data. You know, they're very particular about that so you have to understand how they are behaving so if you don't have real experimental data you have to rely on conversation there's no other way so uh, and if you have given with real experimental data in such a case okay it's a computer simulation you have to calibrate the simulation and then you have to do we want to do whatever you want to do we can do yeah. so what are the it's challenges like right yeah uh, so what are the challenges one can face in these methods uh from from semiconductor view right or from Electronics point of view, I can tell you the challenges. Obviously, uh, as I said, one of the challenges is hard to find ex real uh, experimental data. So, uh, industry should not reveal that. We are from, actually, we are from, as we are doing, so we are from industry. We are not a working industry. We have some tie up, but we are from research institute. So, we have some all limitations. We have access to the papers. We can check what research is going on, but we cannot say what industry is doing exactly for the three nanometer node or whatever. Even mm -hmm. if, if, in such a case, they, we made uh, release the uh, release some data sheet then we data sheet then we can see otherwise it's very difficult i mean even if you ask some of the industry guys you not tell this and yeah so this is one of the challenges okay then you have to rely on tcat this is one of the challenges a computer simulation second challenge maybe to get enough experimental okay so as i said to get ex enough experimental data second challenge okay so machine learning part of your challenge we haven't faced yet near future it may be because okay one of the challenges let's say uh, if you don't have enough domain knowledge, for example, all the physics we cannot incorporate in the model. That's also a possibility. So mm -hmm. as I remember, I'm talking about um, uh, computer simulation, TCAD, whatever. All the physics we generally try to incorporate, but it's possible that we all we cannot do it properly. You know? In such a case, without the so domain knowledge is lacking. <coughs> in that case, domain knowledge would be lacking. In such a case, machine learning has to come up with some pre-processing, like autoencoder or whatever. They have to implement some pre-processing to improve that we see of that that's the challenging so that will be challenging so we have to do that and another more thing so if you can remember the iv curve let's talk about diodes iv curve or mosfet's iv curve mm -hmm. so offset current is uh, i on by i off there is a term of i on will be uh, 10 to the power 8 to 10 to the 9 times higher than i off it's very high stiff high difference right it's very difficult to model you know in this high difference so current is going literally from uh, one value two in two voltage or three voltage will be 10 to a nine. So it's so high, you know? so huge difference of huge thing. <coughs> Sometimes machine learning cannot handle. Okay. So, I understand my point, right? When you talk okay. about CV plot, CV plot, if you can remember uh, capacitance, uh, capacitance, of, uh, capacitance doesn't vary that much, but IV currents from off state current to on state current or of a diode or of a MOSFET or any kind of FinFET or GFET, it's almost 10 to 8 to 10 to 9 to the order of. If you want to really uh, take control no, of this whole, uh, yeah, as a whole level, a lot of things, variation, then machine learning might fail. So in such a case, you have to make some domains, you know. Maybe in one domain, this machine learning algorithm will be good. In other domain, there will be different algorithm. In other domain, there will be other algorithm. You understand, right? So this yeah, is so kind of classification, we, kind of classifying exactly. the it's another, different another, types. Another reason, exactly. This is something you have to do to <coughs> improve the performance or improve the efficiency of the machine learning. So only one algorithm may not be sufficient. So already there are some published paper on this direction. So I've seen that. Uh, particularly this, uh, this uh, I don't know this. This is how much value value for in other 
<coughs> other than semiconductor science. But semiconductor, obviously, because ion by IOF is very huge. So all on a sudden, current is changing from uh, one pico ampere to one ampere, you see, or you know, 10 to minus two ampere, whatever. So you have to incorporate all the variations, a lot of a lot of data simulation data, and a lot of regional uh, change you have to do so that, and then you have to do auto encoding and those things. There are other other techniques, right? Pre-processing of machine learning. So before using machine learning, you have to do some more algorithm part of some improvement. This so is Jaydeep, a challenge. This is another challenge. Yeah. So Jaydeep, if you are uh, able to find out defects from the IC chips we're using in machine learning, to how do, uh, how much cost do you think we can save uh, so that these chips are not getting manufactured yeah. or there is That's a good question, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the cost obviously industry can save. Industry, if, uh, if one sells to industry this idea that we can do this this way, I think industry is interested in hiring. <laughs> yeah. Because they know the out of 100 chips, one is failing. Okay, and experimental data, and obviously, and then come up with that chip. And if you can save cost saving, I don't know how much, but it will be beneficial. And I can tell you because the ML guy, mostly the ML guys, they don't know the at all. So uh, the electronics guy, they don't, they're okay, they, are, they know somewhat of email, but not into that. If you're a middle person, then he knows those things, right? And he can tie up with this thing. Right? Mm -hmm. So cost, uh, how much can you save? Somewhat of amount, obviously 50%, obviously they'll save. 50%? They I don't know, but maybe let's say 30 to 40 percent. I have to, yeah, this costing from industry point of view, there are a lot of parameters, right? So you cannot predict as well. It's like a machine learning problem. We have to have, we have to know all the parameters then to predict. But yeah, they will be beneficial, it's for sure, because uh, in the industry, there are a lot of instruments. I've seen the industry, they have uh, a lot of instruments. Uh, they're very, obviously, instruments are very expensive. So if you come up with machine learning algorithm, which can tell something of what instruments are doing, then obviously that cost will be reduced. So that's how it is. So yeah, so industries get, uh, for example, any industry called com IBM, whatever, they get also cheats from other parts. They do some analysis, whatever, yeah. And uh, they are big machines and they are big engineers are allocated for that. Yeah, so if machine learning can do that, or oh, it's not easy, I'm not saying it's very easy. But obviously there are challenges, as I told you. So those challenges, uh, from domain expertise point of view and also machine learning expert for expertise point of view, you have to face that. But if you can do that, obviously, that will be very beneficial for industries. Okay. Yeah, so they have any... section for failure analysis as far as I know. So. And any other use case you want to share? Any more two use cases? Yeah, use you... case obviously, use case obviously, I said. So, uh, okay, one of the cases that we published last year, so it's I can tell talk about that. So, yeah, yeah sure, so bridge, sure. defect, yes. yeah, bridge defect that we considered, there is a register short between uh so we had a finfet three-dimensional finfet device and then uh three-dimensional device means it's complicated already so uh it's a you have to do a simulation takes time this ticket not ml ml okay ml later on but before that the simulation the ticket simulation take will take time and there's no convergence issues and all those things all those things and yeah so we put actual resistances in different places and uh, we had to understand how it, if, how it's affecting the device. So, for example, uh, resistance near to the source end. So, in a MOSFET, we have source, gate, and drain. So, say resistance in the source end will be have, uh, will give us different characteristics, and resistance in the drain end will give us different characteristics. Those things we checked, and then we made a uh, database database of uh, different features. Feature like as I told you, a couple of features I told you, so ion, IOF. Okay, so off on state current, off state current, and then sub threshold swing, and then threshold voltage. A lot of actually threshold voltage depends on a lot of parameters, and so on. These are the, all the feature tables that we made, 30 features, and then we were checking. Actually, random forest we were checking. Uh, we had a data set of I think 1,000, and they checked uh, uh, for training purpose. They use 80 percent of data, and they checked by random forest. It was giving a 96 percent accuracy, which is pretty good actually. That means the feature sets is very uh, relevant. They're very relevant. And we, we could make uh, that. Then in another paper, so as we're talking about diode, the diode, they are doing some reverse engineering. So reverse engineering, basically nothing. You are given with IV curve and CV curve. We have to predict the dimension of the device, doping okay. of the device. This is kind of reverse engineering. So they are training this machine with this uh, doping. They're varying the doping. They are saying, OK, there was a few variation of doping. It's a defect. You understand. So defect can mean a lot of things. Actually. And the variation of the geometry of the device is a defect. 
they were talk, talking thinking like that. So they 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 didn't vary uh, at the same time. So one time they varied uh, doping concentration. One second time they varied <coughs> dimension of the device to make the database so that they can of uh, real experimental data if it's given that IV you know current versus voltage is like that. Then they can say okay the device geometry will be like that. Okay. And the device uh, geometry or device doping should be like that in that range, exactly this mm -hmm. value. This is the reverse engineering. This kind of problem also solved. There, uh, people have used machine learning for that. And in that case, okay, as I sold this IV and all those things, uh, we have to have region and domain expertise along with ML expertise and pre processing states are very much required. In our bridge defect case, it wasn't required, but in, there, in, uh, in another work, it was required. And as I told you, so as a from device point of view, one can think about circuit microchips and a lot of things. I mean, also material point of view. So if you go for silicon material or three five materials, uh, mm -hmm. from from engineering, if engineering guys, uh, electronics guys are here, they can understand. So obviously, different material will have different different kind of behavior. So you have to try to model it and make a digital twin. That's the problem. Yeah. So that's how it is the people are using as in our uh, also the papers we, i mean uh, honestly speaking last three three or four years people are serious about at least in research line obviously and if the re people are uh, serious in research line today people will be serious in industry after 10 years it's like that basically or eight to ten years whatever okay. <coughs> so people are doing uh this kind of this approach they are taking this approach to understand how uh, presence of a defect can you know can be identified in a microchip and uh, they are publishing papers in this direction it's particularly since last four years so five years uh or let's so say it's four a, years relatively so. a very new novel yeah, it's, it's, exactly, exactly. It's, yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly people are yeah, thinking so what, seriously yeah so what organizations who want to adopt this uh should do any suggestions do you have like uh, other than domain knowledge i think most of the electronics organization must have the domain knowledge so how hmm. do they uh, make a transition uh, to adopt machine learning so that they can save cost and fully automate the process of finding uh, defects in your chips yeah so okay so in such a case they have to have machine learning guy who and also they should have it's good if the guy has some domain knowledge as well because only machine learning may not be enough uh, mm -hmm. I was talking about the, some research topics, but the industry has a lot of other problems. So industry is not as, mm -hmm. uh, it's not, I mean, if I talk about defect, defect is just a one or two, three things maybe they told you. So the, mm -hmm. in my case, from research point of view, defect may be a presence of a very resistant short, or mm -hmm. defect can be variation of the doping, or defect can be uh, dimension change. But in industry point of view, there might be other effect, other aspects. <coughs> and defect can arise from the process technology as well, because as you said, so we are talking about five nanometer nodes, so miniature is device. So you have to have very specific process steps and a lot of process steps that people are using. Uh, that's really complicated things that we really don't know what kind of process steps they're using. So their defect may arise from those parts as well. So it's a very complicated thing. So domain knowledge and then machine learning expertise, and they have to understand whether they can make a benefit out of that or not. <coughs> if industries so understand, they can make a benefit. This. Understanding yeah. the use case for the domain. Uh, so understand the use case and they have to get some benefits, then they will go switch towards this more using machine learning. But they are bound to do that because AI yeah, is the kind of boom we see into this world. Even we passed from 2005, so uh, neural network wasn't that much of a popular business, but now it's really, really more. Yeah. Everywhere. In basically everywhere. So semiconductor industry is also, they have to think about these things. Uh, as I've yeah. given you some examples, they must consider those things to yeah, yeah, so where do you see them. yeah, so where do you see other use cases? Means uh, where is the industry? You said the industry is slowly going to adopt it because the uh, adaptation is quite slow. So what all things you see can uh, electronics or your chip circuits can help? Uh, can it help or uh, to design chips which are faster and put in uh, not only in PCs, laptops, or supercomputers? or in special cases of robots, can we make those IC chips uh, very uh, resistant and fault tolerant and uh, identify the faults and make uh, make a more- Yeah, like a yeah that's a huge task actually. We have to go in yeah. this direction, honestly speaking. So we have to start with the first thing and then the IC chip is a big thing because in a, in a in a chip we have might have a lot of a lot of devices a lot of things so before before going to that we have to understand how how machine learning is how okay so if you have accuracy of 96 or 90 above 90 percent it's okay but later on 
later on the features also i was talking about the features so how many features can be really measured can be measured that's also important so if we can you cannot write in mathematical point of view this feature give it that feature it's not like that feature based they should be based on the measured real measured fact. if you can't really measure those features so you cannot use those features so uh, if you are well, from uh, research point of view, I'm using 30 features. First, from industry point of view, feature maybe five or ten, you know, eight okay. to ten, maybe, maybe because they cannot measure the other features. There are just parameters. So in such a case, it will be complicated. So those things, yeah, then then things will be complicated. So uh, one has to come up with new algorithms. So up to now, we haven't done that. But later on, uh, another thing we do, we may not have a lot of lot of data. So as I told you, so 1,000 data, 2,000 data, 6,000, 10,000 data, okay, big data, it's okay. But if we even have 100 data, <coughs> can you solve, can it can you still, still do a perform a good good way? This is another question. So actually, guys are also looking for, if you have low number of data, then how to resolve some problems. It's another thing. Okay, machine learning, big data, when you're given with big data, you can understand the pattern. It's a mathematical point of view, but whether in reality, big data may not be available, you know? And for a particular device, maybe you only have 80 data. Can you really predict the behavior of the device? That's a question we have to solve. So yeah, so we have to come up with new algorithm in such a case. So it's not an easy thing. So if, if you have to come up with new algorithm, means means more towards data science research work. But people okay, can do that, yeah. Yeah, so let's have a take a question from the audience. His name is Arko Prabhu Sharkar. He's also a very known researcher, I think. Uh, okay. Even when he is asking, he, even people without electronics background know about Moore's law. So, is the use of ML imply that Moore's law gets even faster now? So, oh, can Moore's we, law can, actually it's a, it's a good question. But Moore's law basically now going to an end actually. So, if you talk about two nanometer, now really don't have much space. Now we have to okay. There are otherwise beyond CMOS. There are new technologies. Okay, so beyond CMOS, I also worked before. So, but machine learning I've never used there. So yeah, beyond CMOS, I mean Moore's law. Yeah, it's going to be end soon. So we have to expand in a in a lateral direction. So okay, so from a monetization point of view, it's kind of this bottleneck, and then we have to improve like this way and to yeah. Then machine learning. Okay, machine learning uh, will be necessary. Well, the, the the use cases that I told you. So. And if uh, if it's good, then if you're giving a good, then yeah, the industry will say, okay, you can still still continue doing something. In such a case, it can help uh, help to develop <coughs> or help continue this uh, miniaturization. But I don't know miniaturization one nanometer now almost 1.5 nanometer. It's almost atomic scale resolution now. So if you cannot miniaturize or not, uh, but if you if you really from material sense of view, if you can find a defect in a from material point of view, these are the 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 examples that I told you, this is from device point of view. So it's a bigger, bigger point of view. But material point of view, one nanometer, Armstrong level, you have can also think of defects. And it's really difficult to, you know, it's, it, those defects are also very difficult to measure, first of all. So machine learning will be required on those things, OK? In such a case, yeah, most of, most of, most of will be helped by this uh, machine learning techniques as possible. So it can get even faster if you have automate those machine yes, learning exactly, algorithms. Exactly, exactly. That's, that's a very good question. And also another question from uh, Prabhu Sharkar is that can we expect faster innovation in consumer devices? Once you said that the innovations are happening, research results are coming out last five, four to five years in the space of machine learning with electronics. So can we expect faster innovation in consumer devices? Consumer devices, okay, from defect point of view, yes, as I told you, so yeah, so in that case, yes, consumer electronics and then other cases I'm not sure then I have to go through, but yeah, from if you if you think about failure analysis, obviously if failure analysis is improved for using this machine learning algorithm, obviously consumer electrons will be helped as well. Okay, Jadip, I have one more question uh, before we I ask you something. So is this IC chips, the failure analysis you are talking about, is it right when during manufacturing or fabrication? What happens if some of my IC, IP, IC chips are failing when it is running? So can uh, the machine learning uh, uh, algorithms can be programmed to identify those means when the IC chips are already yeah, yeah. deployed? So, so, exactly. So so more features. Actually, you will, OK, so when IC chips are fabricated, they generally OK, so they have some reliability issues. So, so they say it for three, four, four years. For example, your your iPhone, right? iPhone after four years or five years, it's basically or three to four years. OK, there is a reliability issue, right? There will be battery problems, there will be other problems. Even your laptops or your hardware. 
Laptops, obviously, thermal problem, heating problem, all those things. Yeah, it is happens actually. See, if a running problem, okay, if you have, if you can come up with a failure detection right at the beginning, <coughs> in such a case, you will have less number of problems during runtime. That I can say, that I can guarantee. If you can detect failure right at the beginning of the IC chip, then then the uh, success rate will be high. You know, your laptop. In such a case, in bigger, broader point of view, obviously, your laptop will run for ten years or twenty years or so. But in generally, okay. So this reliability is a big issue actually in electronics. Electronic devices are not that reliable like <coughs> other things. People are trying to improve that. Failure is just a part of that. But reliability is a lot of things that we consider. People consider so how to improve reliability. Of the device, so failure analysis is the particular thing that I told you. There are other success as well. I mean, in failure analysis, there are different sections. I just told you uh, three or four sections that we work with. Obviously, there are other things. Yeah. So if if obvious to answer your question, so if you if you can re really reduce the problem or problem of the microchip right at the beginning, so mm -hmm. uh, then obviously chip will run for a longer time. So in such a case, it will not have an error. If you have a runtime error in such a case, obviously one has to think how to how to train the machine learning to improve or to detect those kind of results. So I haven't done that, but one can think about, then has to think about other features and how to, how to uh, find it out. Yeah, some innovations is required in that direction. Yeah, yeah, that, that's definitely will help uh, our lives yeah, much easier. That's true, that's yeah. true. Then, if we, yeah, we don't phone have will learn for a longer time, yeah. We don't have to wait for the laptop to get repaired. Means like we will know for five days before it's uh, going to some of the chips or something is going to fail yeah. soon. Even yeah, the refrigerator yeah, yeah. or the washing machine, everything is digital. So yeah, exactly, chips, exactly. yeah, yeah. Everywhere we know that there are chips, IC chips uh, somewhere incorporated. Everywhere, I'm not from also, the domain. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah it's so if you can identify the so, yeah. predictive mm -hmm. analysis, if you can incorporate. Uh, exactly. Uh, exactly. And, this is another interesting, interesting issue. One has to think about that, obviously, and then it has to and obvious domain knowledge will be required, as I told you, and what kind of and they have to machine has to be trained on basis of something, right? Some some previous experience. So, what kind of problem it might happen, or a real computer simulation can really do that or not? This kind of tools that I told you that they probably. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether people can use those tools to resolve this problem or not, or maybe come, somebody has to come up with their own tool. That's a big task, actually. It's not easy. Uh, so but there are some reliability tools, actually, reliability software. So, so you you talked about some of the simulation tools. Do you want to summarize those? Or and I have one more question regarding that. Can MATLAB be also be used in uh, in MATLAB? Because yeah, actually, I, I knew one guy who was using MATLAB in his PhD thesis uh, to do machine okay. learning. He didn't use Python, but MATLAB, okay, yeah, my MATLAB tool, as I told you, is a tool. If you have come among with a new, for example, magnetic device, I didn't tell, I talk about magnetic stuff, so magnetic devices. So mm -hmm. in some cases, TCAD that I told you, TCAD may not function well for magnetic devices. You have to have, or you have to come out with your own tool to implement magnetic MRAMs, you know, a lot of things, other things. I'm not going to that much of physics. There are a lot of domain knowledge required. But yes, then he has to come up with a new tool development to understand how a magnetic device behaves and how to implement defect in those devices. In such a case, MATLAB can be used. You know, if there are some equations to be solved iteratively, and then he has to come up with some equation as to solve it, make a solver. Uh, it has to develop a solver in MATLAB or any other programming language, I don't know. Then it's possible there. Yeah. OK. OK. So uh, apart from TCAD, any other tool you would like to add to that Spice. so that uh, for circuit spice, very standard thing. Spice, spice. Uh, yeah, spice. spice, yeah, spice, spice simulation, yeah, from circuit point of view. Okay, from device TCAD, for material there is the tool DFT, uh, density function theory. There are some tools actually. Synopsis product they have, so they have. I used it actually, and there is the one product fast VSP which does material simulation, and then uh, there's a synopsis tool. I forgot the name, but anyway, yeah, quantum espresso that does this material science uh, simulation. Uh, from circuit simulation, cadence, uh, cadence, spice, yeah. yeah, spice, uh, then yeah, those, those things. It's a pretty standard things. I mean, yeah, people can use those tools in a productive way actually. Uh, and then from device, okay, TCAT, TCAT also a lot of distribution. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Hello. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, please go ahead. I can hear you. Hello. Yeah, please go ahead. I can hear you. 
Yeah, so that's how it is. So a yeah, lot of tools can be available, but if you need to develop a tool, you have to come up with your own tool because not all tools can help you for everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so uh, yeah. any other yeah, any other future direction you would try to say, uh, Dr. Uh, Joydeep, uh, because it was a very interesting discussion and you have come from a very niche domain like semiconductors and you're applying machine learning to find failure analysis means that can save costs up to, I think, a uh, lot of cost, right? Millions, means because I devices so, yeah. that manufacture yeah, in, yeah. Uh, in, in production factories in lots, the IC chips, and they are ultimately put into devices. And these devices are, are, are the end products that the customers are using. So if you can mm -hmm. identify, it can add reliability, as you have rightly told. So what is a vision that you are looking like uh, where uh, other it can take uh, in robotics, in uh, mechanics, uh, any other field? Do you think that or your based on your experience that do you think that uh, machine learning and failure analysis can take a new dimension? as we progress okay so as i told you so from manufacturing industry so manufacturing guys they they can use some robotic arms and they can i mean they can increase this use of those you know and then robots must be trained right this is one of the aspects obviously uh failure analysis as i told you is another aspect and then from physics point of view okay so i mean okay so i can only tell you about this nano electronic stuff the, uh, yeah, yeah, sure, there are sure. lot of, yeah there are a lot of domains of physics actually that's really it's not easy actually i mean i don't know much about what's going on over the people are yeah using yeah but, but do, yeah nano but, electronics where do you see uh, the yeah. other applications of ml uh that that might get used yeah so maybe maybe yeah. test, test 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 development of testing testing of microchip that's development what is the base so we have to train the machine or train the machine on basis of some uh existing things and then machine can predict you the what's the best test case or the uh how do how do you make the measurements or there are a couple of uh, something like that yeah so yeah so that's another aspect that people are using machine learning and uh yeah yeah for testing purpose and then yeah this this is more or less these things and uh, okay so i don't know what else i have to check it more or less yeah, uh, as far as I know, from my point of view, this yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, a, a, any other uh, thing do you want to add, which I have uh, missed to ask you, or any uh, anything you see that because nowadays I hear a lot about IoT, blockchain. Uh, so, do you think anywhere in nano electronics plays a role, or you want to add anything uh, which I okay. have not? Okay. So, um, yeah. Okay. So, neuromorphic computing is another hardware side. So, we have to we have to have hardware. What computing? Sorry. Uh, neuromorphic computing so in this aspect but okay so it's basically a hardware approach so yeah so mm. you have to you have to you have to mimic the human brain that's the idea so the so software point of view okay yeah and then hardware point of view obviously and uh okay so from big data point of view okay as i told you so we have a very complicated circuit right so then data will be millions of data and you know and then another thing, let's say, let's talk about very complicated to make things complicated. How can you make the complicated? Uh, we think about one device. Mm -hmm. Hello. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I can so, hear. Yeah. So we were thinking about one uh, defect, defect at the one device, but we, uh, we can also think about defect at multiple positions. So we have to have a class, a lot of classes. So if we, if we, in my case, one of the cases, I had five classes. If I take a uh, other combinations then class is almost 100 so it's a huge thing another thing okay okay if you have from let's say a little bit on transfer learning if you know one thing can you really implement for the other thing other kind of device other kind of device that's another approach i cannot reveal all those things but people we are doing this or we are just taking in this if you have knowledge of one one kind of thing or one circuit can you really predict the problem in the other other kind other with other devices or other circuits. That's another thing. Uh, mm -hmm. The continual learning, another point, continual learning, if you know one thing, then uh, if you can test whether uh, the algorithm remembers the whole thing and he can also, algorithm can predict the next thing as well. So these things are to be investigated. It's a going ongoing research. People have, will do that in this direction. Uh, this will lead a lot of domain knowledge or physics, actually. From TCAD point of view, obviously, there are a lot of physics, which I didn't tell. Uh, TCAD in TCAD, uh we can have a physics effect of quantum effects as well this can be incorporated in ticket in the in the simulator and uh, we cannot we have we can have temperature effects 
we can have a lot of others uh, noise noise modeling noise things and then yeah so many things of things to make the things complicated or the stuff complicated so we have to start from the scratch from the beginning and you have to incorporate all those models and add on add on and add on and you have to improve the and it be model. complicated yeah improve the model and complexity these things can be done yeah so yeah that's how it is and then as i told you some material part of you people also do dft so dft is basically density function theory there has to has a lot of uh, physics knowledge you know honestly speaking without physics people cannot do that tcat is still okay tcat is more towards industry thing but dft is a very specific thing uh that one has to assume anybody problem just solve this solve so that's the real solution of uh, schrodinger equation or whatever both that approach needs a lot of physics knowledge so by using as i told you material defect can be detected as well from material point of view but one has to have that knowledge yeah so this is so to be uh, this still uh, still there yeah uh, this uh, another question this may be a little tangential but we would love to know your take on quantum computing how realistic and achievable it is uh, any impact on data privacy passwords Is what is your take? What you think as uh, quantum computing? Maybe you may not have worked in terms of machine learning, but as a researcher, academic researcher with an industry experience, what do you think? Uh, where we are heading with terms of quantum computing? Is it really achievable? Realistic? And uh, any realistic? Actually, actually, we have to write something on that, so I cannot tell you on details. Yeah, but it's 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 realistic. It's not it's not. impossible quantum computing is basically comp quantum computer i mean digital computer is 0 and 1 right so quantum mm -hmm. computer might have a uh, several bits like alpha 1 plus beta 0 something like that so its computation power will be very high but i i cannot tell you much about that so uh, we are working this direction so i don't have much experience as well but okay but What but that's that really stupid people are people are doing that yeah i know that yeah Okay. Any impact do you think on privacy or passwords, etc., for nano electronics yes, or? Yes, from any? security. From security is the software yeah. thing. So nano electronics, I don't know how much I can relate to nano electronics. Nano electronics, one of the stuffs that I was saying is very much experimental also. Right? But security is basically as uh, a it's a different topic in computer science, right? Security or computer science security. It's a very much software driven thing. So uh, I, I I don't have that much knowledge right now. to talk about security and machine learning people also obviously there are some experts on that direction but yeah i yeah this from nano electronics or from hardware or how how do how do you get rid of this problems in hardware and use the software that's what i can tell you uh, okay. security i don't know how much yeah yeah so what is your advice my last question if there is no more audience questions is coming up uh, what is your advice to students who are pursuing say btech uh, electronics should they sh make a Career transition directly to data science, or they should uh, because everybody is now data science is a hype. Everybody is yeah, uh, yeah. looking for a job yeah, in data is, science, or they should continue uh, in the yeah. Actually, field. actually, when we were students, so okay, so data science wasn't that popular, but these days it's very popular. Yeah. Also, I mean, uh, Stanford professors and Berkeley, they those big, 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 big guys there. Talking, they are giving some lectures, right? Online lectures on machine learning, so that you know, it's a, it's a basically, it's a machine learning as far as I know, it's a topic you have to do a lot of uh, how to say it uh, tuning a lot of tuning is required because the algorithms that you guys use obviously there are a lot of parameters so you have to do a lot of tuning to understand how the data is and then you have to uh, use different algorithms sometimes you have to come up with your own algorithm if it doesn't work the algorithm doesn't work in my case algorithm was giving me for more than 90% accuracy which is pretty good but a lot of cases algorithm does give you only 30% accuracy in such a case you have to you have to know how to tackle this problem so it's an interesting field from electronics point of view okay so i have majority worked in electronics now i'm so little bit using machine learning so i don't have much i'm still learning so uh, if you can I'll use the algorithm then and there is otherwise you have to do pre process thing you know uh, auto encoders and all those things pca those things you have to do so you have to know these things but yeah from btech point of view i would say okay if you are interested in data science Data scientist, if you are really data scientist, you don't need a much of your knowledge of electronics. Honestly, you are a software guy. You have to know uh, mathematics and statistical from formulations and those things. But the guys who are on electronics or electrical engineering, you they can also you start doing machine learning. They say they have a big prospect, and your electronics knowledge of electronics will be useful if you can if you can go to 
uh, some uh, companies like Macron or end up in Qualcomm, uh, these companies, uh, if you have this uh, knowledge, your background of electronics, it will be useful if you start a career in data science there. <coughs> so it's a good field. You guys can learn. Uh, that's, that's, that's something I can say. And if you have domain knowledge, that would be useful if you go for domain industry. But if you go for only algorithm based work, uh, things, okay. But if you have, yeah, so it may not be that much of interest. But if you go for electronics industry, they are using machine learning, they are adopting machine learning, then you'll be very, you know, very helpful for you if you have this knowledge. Okay. Great to have that kind of advice. Now, if you want to be a researcher, then obviously machine learning also cracking research field as well. Uh, machine learning is basically cracking everywhere. So industry is research, academia, and so on. And yeah, so if you're a researcher, obviously you should, it's better to have some machine learning background. OK. So it was a great discussion. Uh, if you want, if you have any thing uh, which I have missed, you can add. Or else I can tell the audience that uh, he's available on LinkedIn. He's available, uh, he's a NUS researcher in the field of nanoelectronics and, uh, and solid state devices. So if you have any questions, you are an engineering graduate or you have some questions related to your career, please feel free to reach him out. He can clarify your doubts and you can even collaborate with him because he is very well known. He has a very accomplished researcher. He has published papers. He has won numerous awards. And also, not only this, he also comes with a background of software. He has done extensive C, C++ coding during his PhD. He also has Java experience. And he's just, uh, I would say, a right blend of research and industry experience he carries. So even if you're thinking like you want to be a data scientist or you want to move into electronics, perceived electronics, and uh, apply data science, so please feel free to reach him out and ask him your doubts. So Jaydeep, do you want to uh, add any other thing? Since it was absolutely a pleasure to host you. It's nice, and you wonderful. Thank you very much for I mean, asking me to join this. Obviously, you're doing a good thing, and you're obviously asking very relevant questions, which I'm very happy to answer. If people can understand and relate this uh, in real experimental stuff with machine learning, that's really they can they they understand a lot. Because uh, mostly people, uh, okay, so from software point of view, they don't know much about physics and all those things, right? But uh, basically, what I talk about is more experimental and then going towards this machine learning, which will help reducing number of experiment, experiments, for example. Uh, yeah, so it's a different thing. Yeah, it's a different thing, yeah. It can save time, useful, cost. Yeah. It can save time, cost, and that's why I, I discussed all those things. But yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, you also you are doing very good in your company, as I know. So uh, thanks for inviting. I, yeah, it's a good, good discussion. Your questions are very relevant. Uh, I try yeah. to answer, answer as far as I can. The other stuff I, I yeah, have to yeah, hide because yeah, <laughs> yeah, so it's like that. Yeah, thanks for your time once again, and it will be a pleasure to host you again with some different uh, perspectives of machine learning. So keep in touch, Dr. Jaydeep. And yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward. Thank you I'm once doing, again. Yeah, excellent. I'll use machine learning in coming in one year, so I can come up with some new story next time. Yeah, yeah. So his papers are also available online. Uh, uh, you can go and uh, search for his papers and read about them. And if you have questions, do ping him. And it's it's really a great pleasure. And thank you once again for agreeing to come here. Okay. Oh Dr. no Jaydeep. problem. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.